This is Dr. Gooden talking about sexual variance, abuse, and dysfunctions. Sex is an underlying motivator behind most of our actions. I commonly joke about this. Um, if you want to get to the root of the root of why you came to class today, it's so you can make more money, so you can, or so you can get a degree, so you can make more money, so you can be more sexually attractive to others, and so you can have sex. Um, or it's because there's somebody, you know, possibly a sexual partner in the class. Um, multiple opportunities to tie everything we do back to um, sex. It's not to be crude, it's just uh, the truth. Um, yeah, I always joked with uh, students or even friends that would say, uh, female friends especially, who like to say they want to go dance at the club. And uh, they pretended it has nothing to do with um, sex or the opposite sex or whatever they're into. It was always just dancing to have fun. And, of course, night after night, they'd come home with somebody. Uh, and... Uh, I think perhaps I mean, this is a discussion item. Are our males a little more uh, forthright about, even with themselves, about their their reasons? Um, and this could be, you know, sort of our our sexist culture. Um, not that all our culture is sexist against females, um, but some some things still are. That uh, women have to say, "I'm going out to dance to have fun," when. Um, that may be a remnant of sort of the uh, the negative uh, feelings against females being uh, sexual or promiscuous, uh, you know, and and not judging that the same as uh, historically we have as ma uh, for males um, saying that's you know guys can say well I'm hoping to go get laid tonight or or whatever they say. Um, Note that um, as we get into sexual variance, abuse, and dysfunctions, uh, we're going to note that homosexuality was previously considered a mental illness by earlier versions of the DSM. Um, uh, this class, um, keep in mind, this class does not promote a homosexual agenda, uh, but does show respect for all life choices as long as you don't hurt other people. Um, this class is not about a religion. It's not about judgment. It is about learning and trying to understand, to accept others. Uh, if you are a member of a religion that um, that is against homosexuality or or uh, similar types of um, quote alternate lifestyles, I encourage you to to. Uh, Remember that in most of those religions, uh, I've studied them, and uh, one, one of the main facets is to not judge each other. Um, allow your deity to do that. Um, and your jo job is, in most of those religions, is to love one another, regardless of what you perceive as a sin or not. Um, so I encourage uh, tolerance, acceptance. Um, and, and just that we love each other and be peaceful with each other um, so after saying all that that's um, uh, something I wanted to say I'll, I'll move on to the next slide thank you uh, two general categories of sexual variants um, paraphilias there are eight types uh, I notice homosexuality is not listed here um, uh, but uh, fetishism, transvestic fetishism, voyeurism, exhibitionism, sexual sadism, sexual masochism, pedophilia, frauderism, and the not otherwise specified disorders. Um, and that just means um, maybe it's a mixture of one of the, uh, the others, or maybe it's something that we really can't put a label on, but it is uh, destructive. Um, in some way to the person's lifestyle and happiness. Um, so, um, 
Paraphilias are recurrent, intense, sexually arousing fantasies, urges, or behaviors. Notice that sometimes they're just fantasies or urges. They're not always behaviors. They generally involve non-human objects, the suffering or humiliation of oneself or one's partner or children, or other non-consenting per persons. This must last at least six months. They often have a compulsive quality. Um, think about exhibitionists. Sort of have the compulsion to show their genitalia and get that shock value. Um, some may appear hypersexed. Um, some require orgasm four to ten times per day, uh, and they're not—they're not even 13 or 18 anymore. They're, you know, they could be much older, um, past past sort of their sexual peak, and still um, appear to um, give sex more attention than perhaps the uh, general populace. Um, so fetishism here you see a man uh, with female un undergarments over his face uh, likely uh, smelling them sniffing them uh, for pleasure notice that it, um, the objects are often tied to um, to the female but it's the uh, if you think about this in terms of conditioning uh, this object provides the same pleasure that the female um, in this case would provide um, so we'll we'll get into this a little bit. Fetishism is recurrent, intense, sexually arousing fantasies, urges, and behaviors involving the use of some inanimate object to obtain sexual gratification. A fetish is diagnosed only when the object is inanimate. Um, in other words, not alive. But most sex researchers have not made this distinction. That's that's interesting. I think the fetishistic object is usually required or strongly preferred during sexual arousal and activity. Examples can be hair, ears, hands, underclothing, so it can be attached to a real person but in and of itself. Um, it, 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 the hair could be cut from the person's head, you know, get a haircut and get a person, a piece of that person's hair, but the ears um, uh, obviously hopefully still attached um, hands underclothing shoes perfume similar objects associated with the opposite sex and you'll notice that some of these aren't as obvious fetish fetishistic objects um, as our panties or or underwear or bras um, any of that um, they're um, sort of um, different uh, something that I think, uh, for instance, there are a lot of people that would find uh, the undergarments of the of their um, preferred uh, sex, uh, in other words, who who they're into, males or females. They'd find the undergarments um, attractive and and uh, arousing. Um, but I I think you know some of these examples of fetishistic objects, um, hands. Um, shoes, some of these, uh, at least for me, are more difficult to imagine how that that would um, be arousing. Um, they usually masturbate while kissing, fondling, tasting, or smelling the objects. It's common for men to have a paraphernalia. Notice that word, paraphernalia to have paraphernalia and this is like um, bras, garter belts, hose, high heels um, these are objects that that are tied to their um, paraphilia but um, you know they, they keep them around um, uh, bras, garter belts, hose, high heels. Uh, they may even steal or assault to get the fetish object, and most often panties. Sometimes the act of stealing is the true fetish, and the object is meaningless. Um, transvestic fetishism. A heterosexual male 
Notice that distinction. It must be a straight male who experiences recurrent, intense, sexually arousing fantasies, urges, or behaviors that involve cross-dressing as a female. Usually involves masturbation while wearing female clothing or undergarments. So really what we're dealing with here is the fetishistic object is being worn. Um, sexually aroused by the image of themselves as a woman. And you might say by the woman inside of them. It does not apply to gay men who dress in drag. Um, most gay men who dress in drag don't do so for sexual pleasure. Um, childhood sexual abuse may be one cause of this type of behavior. Um, they are more easily sexually aroused. There's a higher frequency of masturbation, greater use of pornography, and often comorbid with other para uh, paraphilias. Voyeurism. Um, I have a friend who has some issues with voyeurism. Um, and of course, when you're dealing with stuff like this, you you know, especially if it's problematic, uh, it could lead to prison or, or at least jail time. Um, you you may um, you may want to get involved in some sort of you know, like they have Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, they have uh, Sex uh, Addicts Anonymous um, (SA). Um, may want to get involved in something like that or um, well, there, there's plenty of, of options, but um, there are plenty of celebrate recovery is another one that comes to mind. Voyeurism is recurrent, intense, sexually arousing fantasies, urges, or behaviors involving the observation, keyword observation, of unsuspecting females who are undressing or of couples engaging in sexual activity. Of course, I'm going to put my own two cents in. Uh, some natural curiosity and wishes to see things uh, is going to be normal. Um, I've never been a woman, so I won't say if it's normal for females as much, uh, but among men, uh, seeing something, anything that is arousing, whether given permission or not, um, is arousing, whether it be the J.C. Penney catalog with the, you know, women and their granny panties or, or uh, you know, somebody uh, undressing in front of you. Um, uh, some of this is normal. When we're talking about voyeurism, we're talking about, obviously, um, great disturbance in life, um, uh, harm to one's uh, happiness and, and lifestyle and future. Um, Usually masturbate during the peeping activity. These are um, often called peeping toms. Um, it's usually young men. Um, so they have to really sort out whether it's just natural curiosity or whether they're doing it on a schedule, um, sort of uh, being very uh, planful about how they they, they do this and whether it's dangerous um, whether they're sitting in cars all night you know with binoculars staring at a window um, that's that's when we're starting to get into more of the voyeuristic side of things rather than just curiosity um, I think uh, there are a lot of males and females who if they saw a naked body in a window they'd probably continue to look for at least a few seconds, if not as long as it lasted. Uh, so there, there is some need for being realistic about, about what is a problem and what is not, and I'm, I'm not the one to judge that, but uh, just think about that for yourselves. Um, it often co-occurs with uh, exhibitionism, so maybe they get caught and then they uh, open up their trench coat and, and uh, shock the uh, person they were viewing. Um, it may often be shy men or timid men. It may derive pleasure from stealing the arousal viewing. Uh, it's sort of um, 
loses its uh, punch, loses its reinforcement if you have permission to do so. Uh, they may have voyeuristic tendencies but don't act upon them due to societal rules and criminal ones, of course. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. A lot of people with all these issues uh, may not always act on them. Uh, so it uh, doesn't mean they're, these are not, again, people with diseases are not necessarily bad people. They may be doing something that is illegal. They may be doing something that you do not want them to do, but they are not necessarily evil or trying to hurt someone. So more about what exhibitionism is. Um, there's my uh, my uncle. No, just kidding. Uh, there's some man uh, and a woman. Uh, exhibitionism, in short, is indecent exposure, recurrent, intense urges, fantasies, or behaviors that involve exposing genitals to others, usually strangers, in inappropriate circumstances and without their consent. The element of shock is highly arousing. They often use secluded locations or near schools or bus stops, um, often while in a car so they can get away, often the same location and time of day. It is the most common sexual offense. It's often accompanied by suggestive gestures, um, masturbatory gestures, um, and it is it does have criminal um, uh, punishments uh, surrounding it. So you'll often hear about um, an exhibitionist being on campus and let's catch them. Here's a here's a picture of their face. If you see this person, report them, run away. Uh, but the shock is arousing. Normally they will wear something like this that um, they can easily open and shock another person. Um, I uh, Yeah, I, I, I had a friend who was a uh, had some voyeuristic problems, but I, I haven't had a friend that I know of who's had exhibitionist issues. Um, here we look at sadism, um, and this is sort of a bad picture for this. Um, I chose it because it comes from the movie Secretary, which is an interesting BDSM uh, movie. Uh, I don't think it's highly um, upsetting, uh, but it's definitely not a family-friendly movie. Um, but the idea behind sadism is is pain. Giving pain is pleasure. We're going to talk about the opposite here in a moment. Uh, it comes from the name of Marquis de Sade, who for sexual purposes inflicted such cruelty on his victims that he was eventually committed as insane. The diagnosis of sadism shows a recurrent, intense, sexually arousing fantasies, urges, or behaviors that involve inflicting psychological, notice psychological in there, or physical pain on another individual. Sadistic fantasies often include themes of dominance, control, and humiliation. It's similar but less severe, um, sorry, similar but less severe to it is bondage and discipline, B and D which may include tying a person up, hitting or spanking, and so on to enhance sexual excitement. It may lead to or terminate in actual sexual relations. It may not. It may lead to sexual gratification in itself. Um, it can slash a woman with a razor or stick her with a needle, um, experiencing an orgasm in the process. They may um, Pain from whipping, biting, cutting, or burning. Uh, they may vary from mild pain to manipulate, sorry, to mutilation, or even murder. And they may or may not have consent. And many of us have transient interest in sadomasochism. I don't say us uh, very generally, but um, there's some that involve a little pain and pleasure mixed together. That's there is a natural uh, relationship between those two, um, uh, I believe, um, but but these are people who um, are arguably consistent with this need for, for pain to be a part of the sexual process. 
Um, it may they may replay torture scenes later while masturbating. Uh, they may videotape uh, and and replay those videotapes. They may occur among serial killers. Think about Ted Bundy from uh, Florida State University, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. Only a disorder when the victim is non-consenting or marked by intense distress or discomfort. Uh, the sadist has a godlike sense of control. Uh, with feelings over that they have control even over life and death. Uh, consistent violent sexual fantasies and collection of materials with a violent theme. Notice violence is is key, and the violence is not just a fun spanking or you know if you believe in that. Um, it's not it's not fun. It's not consensual. Uh, it's not pleasurable for both parties. Um, sadist. Uh, 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 will will take the violence to sort of a, uh, a higher level. Um, masochism. Um, here we see uh, a woman who um, is a willing uh, participant, uh, do everything her master says. And often they use terminology of master and slave, dominant and submissive, words like that. Um, she's going to do it with total conviction and trust, and that, that conviction and trust of uh, the submissive allowing the uh, dominant to be in total control over over the submissive um, is very pleasurable to the dominant. Uh, this is really the opposite of sadism. Um, masochism is derived from the name of the Austrian novelist Leopold V. Schacher Masoch. Uh, whose fictional characters dwell lovingly on the sexual pleasure of pain. A person experiences sexual stimulation and gratification from the experience of pain and degradation in relating to a lover. So it's the, the submissive in this case that is, is receive, receiving pleasure. Now, say, sadism and masochism can obviously go together. The person must have experienced recurrent, intense, sexually arousing fantasies, urges, or behaviors involving the act of being humiliated, beaten, or bound, often in a ritualistic pattern of behavior. Interpersonal, interpersonal masochistic activities require a superior disciplinarian and one obedient slave. The pain is within agreed upon limits. It's often performed communally within dungeons popular in major cities. It may involve men being bound and whipped by women, called dominatrices. Who wear tight, often tight leather or rubber outfits and are paid to inflict pain and humiliation in a sexually charged sense. Here we have, um, let's see, uh, world's best dad picture um, where there was some erotic asphyxia, asphyxia at the beginning of the movie um, causing the death of one of the characters. Um, Obviously, Robin Williams um, in this movie. Autoerotic asphyxia is particularly dangerous. It involves self strangulation to the point of oxygen deprivation, which appears in these individuals to increase the intensity of orgasm by constriction of blood flow to the brain during masturbation. It may result in accidental hanging. Um, all paraphilias are more common among men. Um, they often have multiple paraphilias. Uh, many who die accidentally from autoerotic asphyxia are cross-dressed when found. It may be linked to greater dependence on visual imagery, vis visual sexual imagery, I should say, among males. Women are more emotionally driven with regard to sex. Um, so, I'm going to note here that gender identity disorders is no longer in the DSM-5. Uh, it's now called gender dysphoria. Okay. Um, and when we talk about gender dysphoria, um, it is these things. These are the main things that are listed here: strong and persistent. Uh, cross-gender identification, not merely a desire 
for any perceived cultural ad advantages of being the other sex. In children, the disturbance is manifested by six or more of, um, of these criteria for six months, uh, repeatedly stating the desire to be or insistence that he or she is the other sex, in boys' preference for cross-dressing or stimulating female attire, si sorry, simulating female attire in girls, insistence on wearing only stereotypical masculine clothing, strong and persistent preferences for cross-sex roles in make-believe play or persistent fantasies of being the other sex, a strong rejection of typical toys and games typically played by one sex, so a lot of this, notice it's societally oriented, culturally oriented, intense desire to participate in the stereotypical games and pastimes of the other sex, strong preference for playmates of the other sex, oh, who doesn't enjoy that, but at, at this age it would be um, unlikely, a strong dislike of one's sexual anatomy, notice that, they're, they're going to dislike their own anatomy, a strong desire for the primary which is penis and vagina, or secondary, like menstruation, sex characteristics of the other gender. Um, gender identity refers to one's sense of maleness or femaleness, and it cannot, it can be distinguished, I'm sorry, it can be distinguished from gender role, refers to the masculinity and femininity of one's overt behavior. They feel extreme discomfort and unhappiness with their biological sex, and strongly desire to change to the opposite sex or identify with it. They are often called transsexuals. They may have gender reassignment surgery. Uh, Cross-gender behavior in females is more tolerated by society. Um, and again, as with all disorders, don't think that a little boy just dressing up as a girl one time is gender dysphoria. It is not. It could be think about things needing to be consistent, lasting for a long time, um, need to be uh, recurrent, persistent, very serious. Um, um, it may lead to homosexuality. Um, they're not stigmatized universally. They may be taught how to reduce cross-gender behavior, especially in situations where it might cause interpersonal problems. Um, it's important in treatment, if they seek treatment, to examine inner conflicts, um, usually through psychodynamic uh, types of uh, therapy. Transsexualism, I, I really don't remember if this actress is a transsexual in real life, but in, uh, for instance, I believe the show Nip Tuck, uh, she played a transsexual. Um, Transsexualism occurs in adults with gender identity disorder who desire to change their sex, and surgical advances have made this goal feasible, although expensive. If they don't have a desire to change their sex, they're called transgendered. But if they have the desire, they're called transsexual. Two types of male to female transsexuals, which differ um, in their causes and developmental courses. The homosexual transsexual men are generally very feminine. They have the same sexual orientation as gay men. They resent being labeled as gay since they identify as female, as a, as a woman trapped in a man's body. The autogynophilic transsexual is the second type, appear to have autogynophilia, a paraphilia in which their attraction is to thoughts, images, or fantasies of themselves as a woman. Um, this could have something to do with the prenatal hormone uh, influences. Um, if you haven't taken a break yet, please do so. Um, we're going to get into sexual abuse and childhood sexual abuse. Um, uh, sexual abuse is sexual contact that involves physical or psychological coercion, or at least one individual who cannot reasonably consent to the contact such as a child. This may include pedophilia, incest, and rape. Uh, childhood sexual abuse um, reports vary due to using different definitions of what is a child. Is the child less than 20? Is the child less than 12? And abuse, what is abuse? Is exhibitionism, 
abuse. The short-term effects of childhood sexual abuse are fear, post-traumatic stress disorder, sexual inappropriateness, touching others' genitals or talking about sexual acts um, earlier in life than, than uh, would be normal. Uh, often poor self-esteem as well. There's concern about whether the children's allegations can be trusted and to what degree. Memory recovery is questionable and causes great damage and multiple vulnerabilities and associated associations with psychopathology in later life. I'm sorry, um, that's not the memory recovery, that's the actual sexual um, child abuse. May causes great damage and uh, multiple vulnerabilities and associations to psychopathology in later life. Let's look a little closer at uh, pedophilia. Here I've put a picture of NAMBLA, which is national, sorry, not national, North American Man Boy Love Association. They still want their equal rights. Um, and with all these, uh, you know, whether it be uh, polygamy, whether it be homosexuality, whether it be um, uh, pedophilia, um, these uh, social issues, um, things that we never thought would be uh, considered okay or acceptable. And I don't mind. I don't. I don't mean to put them all together as equals. Um, but but note that um, as society changes, um, what is considered acceptable may change. In this case, pedophilia is still not okay. Um, a paraphilia diagnosed when an adult has recurrent intense sexual urges or fantasies about sexual activity with a pre-pubertal child. In other words, pre-pubescent, right? It's normally before age 11, 12, 13, 14. It may or may not act on their, they may or may not act on their desires. It involves fondling or manipulation of the child's genitals and occasionally penetration. One thing I want to point out here is that while pedophilia uh, in the DSM uh, would be a prepubescent child or, or fantasies of a prepubescent child, anybody who's even with a 16 or 17 year old of the opposite sex and they're you know more than two years older, um, depending on the state and the, the state consent laws, but um, may will often socially be considered a pedophile um, now it, it's becoming more and more difficult um, in our current society with uh, female clothing especially for teenagers we we just had Halloween here and if you've seen some of the uh, costuming uh, for for uh, ten year old girls um, they're you know sexy nurse costumes they they are not um, and they a lot of a lot of the outfits Halloween or otherwise um, sexualize the the young uh, prepubescent child or even the the teenage child um, and um, you know typical clothing often sexualizes them they they often sexualize themselves there is that goal to grow up quickly um, and sometimes with good or bad intentions maybe Maybe they just want to be a grown-up. Um, it's not always seductive behavior for sure, um, but it, it may be confusing. Um, and uh, unfortunately, our society does not yet have a policy of um, of checking, uh, you know, our, our possible sexual mates for uh, and check their ID with a uh, with a black light, and make sure it's real, and make sure they're of age, and uh, uh, which sometimes may be needed. Um, and also, uh, one thing I would add is uh, need to carry around some documentation of whether or not the sexual mate has diseases. If we are going to be um, non-monogamous, um, we may want to be more careful. Um, um, Physical injuries often occur uh, to the child from penetration, uh, but they are not the goal, they are a byproduct. Uh, pedophilia is defined by the body maturity rather than the age of the preferred partner. Um, psychologically, of 
course, not criminally, as I just distinguished. It's mostly males, and most victims are female. That's two-thirds of the victims, mostly between ages 8 and 11. Homosexual pedophiles uh, tend to have more victims. Most use child pornography. Uh, sexual research may use a penile plethysmograph to measure, and it's, it's wrapped around the penis, um, it measures erectile responses to sexual stimuli directly rather than relying on self-report. It's an expandable band placed around the penis that is connected to a recording device. Uh, all right, here we have Cersei and Jamie Lannister. Uh, but I'm not quite to this slide yet, I'm sorry. Uh, child molesters are more likely to believe that children benefit from sexual contact and that they initiate. The children actually, they believe the molester believes that the child initiates and wants the sexual contact. Um, the molester may be shy and introverted, but still desires mastery or dominance over another individual. Some idealize aspects of childhood, such as innocence, unconditional love, or simplicity. I think a lot of us idealize those things, uh, but it's when it, that becomes a sexual thing uh, that it becomes uh, dangerous and possibly criminal. Uh, think about the movie. If you've seen it, uh, Lolita, not a family-friendly movie, but um, that's uh, sort of what we're talking about, uh, idealizing the aspects of childhood. Uh, in that movie, the, the man seems to be sort of sexually and emotionally caught up in uh, in a, uh, a girl that, that he was in love with at age uh, like 14 or something like that. And uh, as he ages, his interests still lie with 14-year-olds. Uh, sort of is uh, sort of a stunted growth sort of issue. Um, many work with children. Many uh, molesters uh, seek work with children and teens in order to have access. Uh, pedophiles or pedophiles doesn't matter how you say it are more likely to have been sexually or physically abused themselves as children. They commonly have lower IQs and three times are more likely to be left-handed, so watch out for left-handed people, right? Um, that, that, um, I say that in jest only. It's probably not a good time to be jesting. Uh, they may have brain structural differences. Um, okay. Um, Cersei and Jamie Lannister. Um, it's a interesting couple there from television, Game of Thrones. Uh, culturally prohibited sexual relations between, notice culturally prohibited sexual relations between family members such as a brother and a sister or a parent and a child. A few societies have sanctioned incest. Um, not current, but past day Egypt, for example, uh, used incest to make sure the royal bloodline was not contaminated. Incest taboo is universal. Um, it often produces children with mental and physical problems because close genetic relatives are much more likely than non-relatives to share the same recessive genes, which often have negative biological effects, and hence produce children with two sets of recessive genes. Evolutionary reasons to spread the gene, uh, the seeds elsewhere. Uh, Men especially have the urge to, quote, conquer new territory, so that, that keeps us away from incest to some degree. Brother-sister incest is the most common type, whereas father-daughter is the second most common, especially when it is a stepfather. Now you have to wonder there, is that still incest? Uh, incest partaking parents differ from pedophiles in their patterns, almost always girls, and more likely to have only one victim. Rape, notice how I've shown two pictures here of very, very random people. Uh, just pictures I found of um, people. Um, so, if you don't know who these people are, that, that's fine. Um, rape describes sexual activity that occurs under actual or threatened forcible coercion of one person by another. Legal definitions usually say that forcible rape involves penetration. Statutory rape is sexual activity with a person 
It is legally defined to be under the age of consent. This varies by state, usually 18. Uh, even if the underage person consents or even asks for it, um, usually men um, rape women. That is more common, unless it's in prison, men against men, or even women against women. Uh, marital rape is illegal now. It has not been always illegal. It's rarely a case of lust, but rather a crime of dominance, power, and control. Humiliate a victim rather than by sexual desire for her or him. Despite the sexual arousal by the victim, it, it is common. If you're going to be touched in your uh, erogenous zones, you are likely to have a physical response. Um, that is not to be confused with wanting it. Okay? Do not confuse the two. If you are the victim, or if you are the victim's friend, if you are the rapist, arousal does not mean wanting it. Um, the victim does not enjoy the act emotionally. It leads to feelings of guilt and shame, usually women in their teens and twenties, which implies some sexual motivation. These women uh, are generally considered more sexually attractive. Rape is often repeated often in neighborhoods where the uh, perpetrator resides, usually urban settings at night. I encourage all of you to be uh, very careful. Um, I've been uh, looking into um, making, making sure that our, our um, response to uh, victim uh, complaint um, uh, is taken very seriously uh, on our campus, uh, especially considering the recent uh, Florida State University issues uh, with uh, prolonged uh, and uh, inappropriate uh, investigation methods um, that were delayed. 33% uh, or more involve more than one offender, and so rape is sometimes done by uh, more than one person. About 67% involve only one offender. That's the math there. Uh, may cause physical trauma and PTSD. Many blame the victim uh, for having revealing clothes, uh, for uh, past sexual behavior, for presence in a risky location. Rape shield laws protect rape victims by preventing the prosecutor from using evidence of a victim's prior sex history. Rape is usually committed by a young man under the age of 25, like this young man. Yeah. Uh, low socioeconomic status is common, likely to have experienced sexual abuse, a violent home environment, and inconsistent caregiving in childhood. So let's talk about date rape for a second. This is um, a more difficult thing to, to pin down, and this would be more of a date rape situation here where the woman is seems to be enjoying herself and um, um, it's when an acquaintance uh, rapes a woman I would say or a man in the context of a date or other social social interaction why is it more males uh, this could be due to strength um, uh, among other reasons um, so an acquaintance who rapes a ma male or female in the context of a date or other social interaction, usually a different demographic, middle to upper class young men without criminal records, still characterized by promiscuity, hostile masculinity, and an emotionally detached or predatory personality. They usually have intoxicated victims. And uh, this young female certainly looks a bit intoxicated. This young man may have been intoxicated as well, who knows. Um, many have a paraphilia, report urges to rape that they cannot control, especially aroused by sex scenarios with an unwilling participant. Um, their personality is often impulsive, a quick loss of temper, a lack of personally intimate relationships, and in insensitivity to social cues or pressures. Many have social and communication deficits. They are known to misread social cues, like uh, friendliness is seen as flirtation. Only half of arrested men are convicted 
only two thirds of these um, actually serve time of the ones that are arrested. So the question is, is it vague? Should a woman or a man be able to say no during sex? The law says it's rape if they say no during sex and it's continued. Um, but I, you know, I would just point out the obvious that it, um, if you've had sex, you, you may be familiar that it's difficult to quit once you've started. Um, not impossible, but difficult. Um, the sex offender registry has helped with the recidivism. Um, aversion therapy may be used. Uh, this could be electric shocks, foul odors that induce nausea combined with paraphilic stimuli. Cognitive restructuring, social skills training, SSRIs, castration or chemical castration through like Depo, Provera, or Lupron uh, may be used in treatment. Many feel castration is too brutal or dehumanizing and unethical. Some offenders actually ask to be castrated in exchange for a lighter sentence. Um, hormone therapy may be tied to probation or parole, as it is in California and Oregon. Um, a question I want you to think about, should we, be, should we feel mercifully towards sex offenders? Should we show mercy? And if so, how much? Um, of course, it's something that is a little more upsetting than other things you can do to people that hurt them. Um, this one gets under our skin, so to speak. Then we're going to talk about some sexual dysfunctions. If you haven't taken another break, now is probably a, a good time to put me on pause, go use the restroom, whatever you need to do. Um, have a beer, not think about childhood sexual abuse or rape. Um, uh, unless you're under 21, don't have a beer. Um, Sexual dysfunctions refers to impairment either in the desire for sexual gratification or in the, in, a, in the ability to achieve it. Impairment varies markedly in degree. It may be caused only by psychological factors. Uh, Masters and Johnson studies, uh, which these two people portray Masters and Johnson in the show Masters of Sex, clever name, right? Uh, these were two actual people um, in St. Louis, um, and um, they've got a TV show about them. Uh, they were some of the first to uh, to do some research on uh, on sex and, and how sex was supposed to work. Um, they cited four phases of arousal. The first phase being the desire phase, fantasies, or a sense of desire for sexual activity. Okay. Uh, the second phase being the excitement phase or arousal phase, characterized both by a subjective sense of sensual, sorry, sexual pleasure and by physiological changes that accompany this subjective pleasure, including penile erection in the male, and vaginal lubrication and clitoral enlargement in the female. Orgasm uh, is the third phase during which there is a release of sexual tension and a peaking of sexual pleasure. Fourth stage is resolution during which the person has a sense of relaxation and well-being. Uh, disorders can occur in stages one through three. Sexual problems affect 43 percent of women and 31 percent of men yearly. This decreases with age in women or increases with age in men. Women have a um, are more common to have a lack of sexual desire, 22 percent, and sexual arousal problems with at 14 percent. Men uh, have issues with climaxing too early at 21%, erectile dysfunction, 5% of the population, and a lack of sexual interest, 5%. Hypoactive uh, sex, sexual desire disorder means little or no sexual drive or interest, uh, very low libido. Uh, psychological factors seem to play greater role than biological ones in this case. When sex is repellent, they may be diagnosed with sexual aversion disorder. Hypoactive sexual desire disorder is comorbid with depression and anxiety in the history of those. So depression and anxiety can lead to this hypoactive sexual desire disorder. SSRIs may stunt sexual desire. Um, one thing I want you to know is about sensate focus. 
This is a treatment method uh, teaching couples to focus on the pleasurable sensations brought about by just uh, simply touching without the goal of actually having intercourse or orgasm. It's a, it's a less uh, pressure oriented environment in which uh, you're just focused on feeling the pleasure alone. Male erectile disorder often the man blames himself while the female blames herself for not being good enough the man blames himself uh, for something's wrong with him um, it's an inability to achieve or maintain an erection sufficient for successful sexual intercourse uh, formerly called impotence only when difficulties are considered to originate from either psychogenic or a combination of psychogenic and medical factors it may be lifelong or situational Anxiety, distractions, performance anxiety, self-defeating thoughts may all play a role. Can be caused by SSRIs in up to 90% of men. It's a common cause for them quitting their meds. Aging, testosterone levels, vascular disease, um, all uh, involve decreased blood flow to the penis or diminished ability for the penis to hold blood to maintain an erection. Medications used include Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, uh, injections of smooth muscle relaxing drugs into the penile erection chambers and vacuum pumps. Uh, lots of money in these drugs, of course. There's a high importance attached to sexual performance and, and great need for these. Um, let's move to females. You see a female with a vibrator, or at least I'm supposing that's a female hand. Uh, subjective quality of female orgasm varies widely by women, so that should be noted. So female sexual arousal disorder can be diagnosed in women who are readily sexually excitable and who otherwise enjoy sexual activity but who show persistent or recurrent delay in or absence of orgasm following a normal sexual excitement phase and who are distressed by their lack of orgasm. Okay. They cannot experience vaginal orgasm without stimulation of the clitoris. Now, this is very common, and most don't consider it a dysfunction. Some can only reach orgasm through clitoral stimulation alone, through the finger, uh, oral stimulation, or uh, the use of a vibrator. It may be situational or lifelong. It's highest in 21 to 24 year olds. There are feelings of fear, inadequacy, anxiety, tension, and sexual guilt. Uh, as you've seen uh, in the media or stories, uh, there uh, often uh, a female may pretend to orgasm. Orgasm leads um, them to actually resent their partner. Uh, SSRIs may be causal and contributory. If the woman is dissatisfied, she should should seek treatment. Cognitive behavioral therapy and education about female anatomy and functioning. Uh, may be helpful uh, relationship problems and working on those relationship problems may contribute um, here we get into sexual pain disorders the first being vaginismus it involves an involuntary spasm of the muscles at the entrance to and outer third of the vagina it's not due to a physical disorder prevents penetration and sexual intercourse um, the vagina actually squeezes together so tightly in a spasm um, that um, nothing can get in at least not without excessive excessive force and it's extremely painful not always involuntary muscle spasms um, emphasis is on persistent difficulties allowing a penis finger or any other object to enter the vagina in spite of the woman's expressed wish to do so they may have sexual arousal disorder, conditioned fears associated with early trauma. Uh, for treatment, there's training of vaginal muscles, self-insertion of vaginal dilators, of increasing size, practicing sexual relaxation exercises, or even um, surgery. Uh, dyspareunia, sorry, dyspareunia. Uh, is painful sex or coitus as it's called coitus means sex um, 
It involves persistent or recurrent genital pain associated with sexual intercourse that causes distress or interpersonal difficulty. It's more common in women, especially young women. It may be due to physical causes, infections, inflammations, vaginal atrophy, tearing. Uh, cognitive behavioral interventions can be used, education about sexuality, identifying and corrective maladaptive cognitions, graduated vaginal vaginal dilation exercises to facilitate penetration and progressive muscle relaxation. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.